And thank you so much for staying with us. We continue with you on all angles and joining us in this segment of the program, the former Minister of National Security, currently the opposition spokesperson on national security, Senator Peter Bonting. Senator, thank you so much for joining us. We appreciate it. My pleasure. Well, I don't know. You might say we have a split decision there when we're talking to our guests earlier on. Jamaicans for Justice says still too many unanswered questions. They still think you need to step down pending resolution of some of those questions. Jamp saying, um, no, they don't think anything that has been done here rises to that level and that you acted within, within the law. So th there have been calls, though. So tell me how you respond to those. Well, first of all, a uh, uh, fantastic amount of the people commenting haven't read the report, first of all. Secondly, there is some curious um, pieces of information missing from the report, and I have made my actual written statement that I responded to the Integrity Com Commission back in 2018. I have released that statement to the public so persons can have a complete picture. It was very curious, for example, that the Integrity Commission's report did not mention the fact that I didn't take these appeals upon myself to review. They went to a distinguished panel, the statutory review board. And I know persons who might chaired, be... Who chaired, who chaired the board? Who chaired the review well, panel at your, at, when you were minister? Um, I think it, it changed... After the first year, I inherited a panel that I started off with. Um, I think Justice Billy Walker was um, the chairman of that. I think the second one was uh, Ken Pantry, a former DPP. Um, Justice Carl Harrison, I believe, was one of the members. Um, I could go back and look, but they were appeal, retired appeal court judges, Supreme Court judges, I'm a senior police officer, retired. So these were all eminently qualified people who were very familiar, not just with the specific law, but in, in, in hearing witnesses determining their, determining their credibility, etc. Okay. So tell me, though, um, because this issue, a lot of people have been focusing on this issue of ministerial discretion and the role of the minister. So you have been asserting for days now so you, you've been doing the rounds, as they say, and you've been, you've been giving your, your position, as you said, and asserting that you did everything by the book and that you acted on the recommendation of the review panel. So the question has to be then, do we need a minister to be involved in this process? As Jeanette says, we have an, we ha we have an eminent panel of people who have expertise in these particular areas, judges involved, senior policemen involved. Why is a politician allowed to, to do what he or she wants under the law? Well, the, my own view is that I, I would be happy if it just ended at the review um, board and whatever they recommended is what would um, be the final outcome. And for all intents and purposes, that's what happened. Uh, you know, Horace Chang spoke as if he had started this process for the first time. He basically returned to a process that every other minister except Montague had followed. Um, no, I didn't write the law. I came, the law was already written. It had the levels and it had the minister's responsibility. I couldn't shirk from that responsibility, but I followed the law meticulously. Which is why I'm picking up on this now, because you're currently yeah. on a joint select committee, in fact, that's looking at a firearm act that yeah. still has... So, the role of the minister in there. So is this not the so, time to act? So the a former cabinet minister, not from the PNP, from the JLP, um, who is now a talk show host, pointed out to me when I said that I, I am indifferent. It could be, you know, I think you could remove the ministerial um, discretion or the role of the minister in the approval altogether. And he pointed out that there are sometimes cases, and it usually doesn't have to be, have anything to do with judging the credibility of witnesses or anything like that. But say, for example, where there is a bilateral um, exchange of intelligence. And, and I did actually come across one case, it wasn't in my time, it was before my time, 
where a person was given a permit to import ammunition. And on the face of it, on the file, it didn't seem that that person should have received that permit. And when I spoke with my predecessor minister, what it turns out was that that was actually a, a sting operation that was set up between the another country and Jamaica. And in order to make it appear as normal as possible and not alert any, anybody that had been done. That is one of the few cases I can imagine where you may need some ministerial discretion, but it certainly never happened during my time. And, you know, and I think for the one in a, you know, one in a thousand or one in 10,000 case where that might be, you know, some special discretion can be provided for in the law without putting you in the normal course of, of the operational work of the ministry or the FLA. Well, what, what though would a PNP administration do differently in terms of the FLA at this point and the Firearm Licensing Act in relation to how the FLA operates? Well, I think too much discretion is left at too many levels. I think, for example, when I was minister, one of the main causes for turning down licenses was this individual has not establish a need to be armed. And when you look further sifted through the files, what you would see is that you rarely ever had somebody who came from Norbrook or Cherry Gardens or an established businessman not uh, being turned down on that basis. But you had, for example, hundreds of policemen, of soldiers who may have had addresses below um, crossroads or in some rural, relatively poor rural community who were denied because they had not established a need to be armed. And I think that, you know, that is too arbitrary. Um, a case could be made that those persons who live in gated communities uptown need a firearm much less than somebody who lives in a so you would change So you would change it how then? I'm saying you have to establish a set of criteria in the law. Persons who meet it qualify. Persons who don't meet it do not qualify. If there is a, 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 you know, a difference in judgment, it can be always uh, appealed judicially. It can be taken to the court. Did the FLA apply these set of objective rules um, properly? But once you leave it to discretion, you, I think that's where, in fact, you open the process to corruption. That is, if, you, if it is at a set of a, an objective criteria, you either meet or don't meet it, then it's easily justiciable if there is any abuse or attempt at abuse of it. Let me Too ask. much. Sorry, finish. Sorry, go ahead. No, no, finish your point. I said, I don't know if you saw a, a letter from a, a, a dealer and range operator recently who was essentially surrendering his license. And he cataloged a whole set of arbitrary and capricious decisions that had been made by the leadership of the FLA that is effectively made it impossible for him to run a viable business. That shouldn't happen. There should, you know, one, one law apply um, for every range operator, for every dealer, etc., for every firearm license holder. And the criteria must be set out and you are measured against that criteria. Let me go back for a moment to the, the cause, in, at least in some quarters, for you to resign. So you've said you're not, your party has come out and they've said you've issued your statement, they stand behind you in that regard. But at the same time, the opposition really has not commented in any serious way on this particular issue. And one gets the impression it's because you're under fire as well. So by insisting on remaining rather than saying, I maintain my innocence, I did nothing wrong, but I'm going to step aside in the interest of the party, are you actually harming your party and your party leader? Absolutely not. Um, you, in fact, were I to step aside, that might suggest that there was something improper, that there was some judgment improperly exercised, that there was some process not followed. Um, 
I am being faithful to the party and to the country by saying to anyone, challenging anyone who believes I should step aside to show me anything that I did that was wrong, that was unlawful, that demonstrated poor judgment, that didn't live both to the letter and the spirit of the Firearms Act, which I was um, obliged to follow. One of the concerns the public has is that we, we set up these agencies to investigate and report, and then when they report, though, people say, okay, something wrong with the report, it wasn't complete, it's it missing, it's inadequate or whatever, and it's like, okay, who are we to believe and why are we setting up these agencies? Do you think there's something inherently wrong in the way in which the Integrity Commission operates? Or is it politicians crying foul because they don't like the name call? Um, I don't think there is anything inherently wrong in how the Integrity Commission was set up. Um, what you will find is that Various officers who um, occupy various posts will have varying degrees of competence. Um, and that, you know, you, you get in, in any organization. I think it was unfortunate that the, okay. this GLP administration Sorry, brought fin finish, in ten, finish in 10 seconds for me, Mr. Bunting. I'm out of time. Yeah, I think it was unfortunate that they brought the Integrity Commission um, into effect prematurely when no transitional arrangements had been made. Okay. So they have been very slow to come out of the blocks. And gonna, I think we are seeing that the quality of some other reports. Gonna have to leave it there. Thank you so much for your time. And thanks to you at home for watching. Come back for another edition of All Angles. I'm Dion Jackson on behalf of the team. Have a great evening, folks. Stay safe and give thanks. <laughs>